Welcome to Design Notes, the show in which we find out how the games you love get onto your table. In this week's show, I talk to a true legend of war game design, Mark Herman. We talk about historical accuracy in games and how he gets inspiration, among many other things. If you have any comments, please feel free to pop them into the box below, and I hope you enjoy the show. So I'm honoured to have a living legend here in the in the arena of war game design, all the way from his palace of solitude somewhere in America. Mark Herman. Mark, thank you for coming on the show. Ben, it's a pleasure again. How are you doing? I, I'm very well, thank you. So my, my first question is, and I ask this everybody, and I, I think it's a nice warmer upper. Um, my first question is, when did you realise that you were good at what you do? Uh, well, my simple answer is I'm not yet sure that's true, so I'm hoping to get good. <laughs> um, but I knew I became competent uh, back when I was in SPI. You know, you know the um, SPI, by the way, is an old company called Simulations Publications Incorporated. It's now a trademark of Decision Games, and um, and you know it was a um, it, it was built upon an apprentice model, you know, Jim Dunnigan and Redmond Simon, particularly Jim Dunnigan, but Redmond Simonson, you know, they took, you know, they, they didn't pay well, but they gave me opportunities to design a whole host of games. Um, I did 18 games, like in two years, you know, oh, less than two years. So when you, and, it, and they used to have a thing, it takes you about six games to figure out how to even become competent at it. And so, you know, if you do 18 games in less than two years, somewhere along the way, I learned the craft of making a game. Uh, and so that's where I, and I, and so, and remember, this is the, this is the days of typesetting machines and photostat machines. And, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's no, uh, the, you know, this is a typewriter, manual typewriters. Uh, I remember when we got electric typewriters, it was a big deal, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. So it was a very, so I understand uh, publication, publishing games from like the, I mean, I've been to, the, I used to go to the printers. I used to deal with the mechanicals. I mean, so I have sort of a, um, a very root, uh, deep knowledge of the actual mechanics of the old style of publishing. Now, of course, now with uh, uh, the, what am I more, uh, so that's when I, I feel that somewhere in that two year period, I became competent being good is I again I always go by what others think. So I think other people think I'm good, and a lot of people think I stink. So it just you know it depends on who you ask and on what day and about what game. I mean, how elusive is that? Because because I do a lot of writing, and some days you sit down and they're they're few and far between. But some days you sit down and just everything clicks together, and you think I'm I can do this. And then most days it's a slog. It's hard work. How elusive for you is? inspiration and how elusive is those are those days when everything just seems to click together um like i guess everybody has their own process so uh i'm always working on almost a dozen titles in my head and i call it like for me the design gets born in other words i apologize for that being being i don't know how to turn that not not notification thing off so i apologize but it'll beep every so often when my granddaughter runs in front of the camera in my house, uh, <laughs> it alerts me that she's there. Uh, so in, in my mind, I'm working on about a dozen games. And when a particular thing comes together in my head, it gets born. I mean, I literally, so I'm not, I'm never trying to fight a process. I, there's always one that's sort of the, just, it may not be, it may be the most recent thing I thought of. It could be something I thought of a year ago, but all of a sudden it's like, Oh, that's how I should do it. And then, and then it just happens rather quickly. I mean, I will go from that moment to a prototype usually in three, four days. And two of the days are just what I call the arts and crafts phase of the whole thing, you know, assembling wood and getting graphics onto some kind of power. I, I use PowerPoint only because I know how to use it. There are a billion, you know, people know how to use all these Adobe, Photoshop and all I don't I've never really learned how to use that stuff so I just take uh, PowerPoint you can make a um, any size slide 
and I make a gigantic slide inside of a map or two maps or whatever it is, and then I pull, you know, get some simple graphics down on it and print it out and put pieces on it, and I start writing rules. For me, a game isn't designed until I actually write a set of rules. I mean, I'm pushing some... Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, I... I was speaking to Volker Runker. I interviewed him for my podcast, okay. and he was he was talking about you, and he was he was sort of saying that you know you're the 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 veteran of wargaming. You were at SPI in the seventies, in the eighties. What was the journey that got you to SPI? When did you first pick up your first war game, and then how did you think I want to oh. make these things? Oh, so I mean, well, first off, uh, I, I learned how to play chess at a very young age. You know, being a, you know, uh, a kid from Brooklyn, uh, chess was very big in Brooklyn. You know, Bobby, even, you know, I'm, I'm probably, Bobby Fisher was probably about 10 years older than me. But, you know, chess was a big thing in Brooklyn. And so I learned how to play chess when I was probably about six, seven. And that was the only strategy game I played. And when I was 12, I was in a card shop and I bought a copy of Avalon Hill's Battle of the Bulge. And I was always interested in military history for some reason. And so the, the two things just clicked at 12. And then uh, if you remember, the old Avalon Hill games used to have the same kind of background color of this, like kind of uh, light blue and light pink pieces. You know, and they have, of course, they printed on them. But every game gave you, you know, there would always be like a couple of extra counters, you know. like you, And over a course of buying, let's say, four or five games, I had a pile of pink counters and a pile of blue counters. And one day I took, I remember there's no... I literally, as a kid, I, I drew a hexagon map by hand, and I did the Battle of Bella Clava, and for those who don't remember what that is, that's a, a, a battle, the famous Charge of the Light Brigade from the uh, Crimean War in the uh, 1850s. And so that was the first game I ever tried to design, so I was about 12. And And so do you think it was the fact that war games were your introduction to gaming that made you a war game designer do you think had you have picked up had you have been born later and you'd have picked up carcassonne as your first game you would have been a euro game designer um you know what i can't you know I, you know as a well so first off i'm a professional historian i may mean, actually have a history degree and i've written you know real i actually wrote a couple of books on you know the london times of london published a book on the history of warfare. I did the, uh, with my old friend Richard Berg, I did the whole uh, ancient section for them. So yeah, I published, you know, published works. And I would tell people that I'm really a historian who's a game designer, not a game designer who's a historian. So mm -hmm. for me, it's the the thing that gets me interested is, oh, look, I, I play all sorts of what are now called Euro games. And, and by the way, they were, um, there's a very famous designer called Sid Saxon. I don't know if you know that name. But Sid mm, is the yeah. one who did all these famous like games like Acquire. I mean, maybe he didn't do Acquire, but he did all these kind of like what I would call, you would call them Euro games. Euro games have existed since the beginning of time. So that just is a term. Uh, I actually know a woman who has a collection of games from the 19th century that looked like Euro games. That just, you know, from the 19th century. So these kind of games have been around forever, you know, and, um, and a very few of them are ever caught on in a big way. Uh, but... What I would say is Sid had an entire collection, probably over a thousand titles, what you, you would call a Euro game, long before that term was ever created. So I was exposed to all those games, that kind of style game, mm -hmm. long before. But it, they didn't interest me personally very much, other than as a social activity. You know, it's fun. You know, you're sitting with a bunch of people and you're, you know, you're, you're having a good time just interacting. But I don't find the topic, you know, the puzzle very interesting. But what I am interested in is, like, you were talking about Volko. So Volko did a really fabulous game called Wilderness War, and and I got and then uh, this other nice guy named uh, Mark Rodrigue uh, just did another game on the. And by the way, Wilderness War is about the uh, the French and Indian War, which is the North American version of the Seven Years' War. And um, Mark Rodrigue just did a game called Bayonets and Tomahawks. Yeah, it's both plural: Bayonets and Tomahawks. So I was playing that. I really liked the game. And I decided to, I couldn't remember, you know, the, the, the history. I had read a lot of books on it, but I hadn't read one in a while. So I started reading a book uh, called Crucible of War, Crucible of War, which is about that war. And all of a sudden, by remembering the history, I could play the game better. Mm -hmm. See, so what I like about war games is there, if a, a good war game is such that if you read the history, you actually immediately understand what strategy should be. 
you know, and people are always talking about, I, I see, you know, and by the way, I find it interesting that I'm on a Dice Tower um, podcast because I would say that Tom probably hates every game I've ever designed. And he, and he said <laughs> so. Now, I happen to know Tom you know, from long ago. He's a great guy. But there's nothing I've ever designed that Tom would even think was a reasonable game. And he'll always say something about, you know, it's not thematic or that, whatever. And I'm going like, okay, it's a history game. And that's the theme, right? So if you don't know anything about the history, the theme is going to mean nothing to you. But they, the, that historical theme is everything for me. And I found people, I'm just sorry, and I have found that people who come from the Euro side and go to the gaming side, they'll say to me, what's the first war game I should play? I've got to ask that question a lot of times. And I'll say to them, okay, what part of history is the most interesting to you? And they'll say whatever. You know, they'll say the English Civil War, they'll say World War II, and and I'll say, here's a game about that topic. Hmm. And then I always get the response, and whenever ever I got in feed, I go, that was a great choice because I really because they they were interested in the topic, so the game worked for them. If I had given them another t- another war game that it was on a topic they knew nothing about, they wouldn't like war games. So it's really that. So to me, um, historical theme is everything for me in a historical game. And and I've seen people pick up Empire of the Sun, which is a very advanced level war game as their first game, but because they wanted to learn about the Pacific War, they had no trouble figuring the game out. It's, and by the way, I have played, because of the friends I have, that I've played probably more as many of the very big title war, uh, Euro games and the Kickstarter game. I've played all of them at least once or twice. And I will tell you that this idea that war games are more complicated than Euro, some of the heavier Euros is just nonsense. And the idea that a war game, a complicated war game, takes more time than a euro game is also nonsense because i've played euro games that go for four hours and i can play empire of the sun scenarios in three so Hmm. i'm sorry three is less than four i don't care how you look at it so (laughs) it's a perceptual thing that war game complicated war games take a long time and but it is true that what they're really saying is how hard is it to teach somebody Hmm. and that's you know I've, i've seen complicated euros that are impossible in fact i've gone in youtube many many times i couldn't even figure out how to play power grid from the rules until I went on a, U- a YouTube video and they taught me how to play it. So, yeah, you know, it's all depends on what you, uh, uh, you know, how you experience these things. And so you mentioned, you know, people have their favorite part of history and that would be the war game you recommend to them. What's your favorite part of history? And is it a period of, of history that you keep coming back to and designing games for? Yeah, well, I, I would say that, the, you know, so... There's two, well, one, I've always been interested in what I call the military conflicts of America. So I did, you know, Washington's War, For the People, Empire of the Sun, that whole thing. And my degree is in ancient history, and particularly ancient Aegean history. So I have done two games on the Peloponnesian War, which I'm, I used to, I've always, I, I, because of the pandemic, but I've lectured, you know, to the U.S. Military uh, uh, Naval Academy. I, I was their main lecturer on Thucydides uh, for uh, over a decade. You know, so I have lectures I give on, you know, ancient history. That was my actual degree. My history degree is actually in ancient history. So those are, you know, so World War II, the American Civil War, American Revolution. Um, I, I would have done a game on the French and Indian War, but I thought Volko did such a good one. I didn't didn't need to, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, and then ancient stuff. And, and I'm actually working on a couple of uh, ancient games. And then um, and also Rome. You know, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, I did the whole um, with my my uh, my uh, good friend, um, may he rest in peace, Richard Berg. We did the whole Great Battles of History series. And I'll be doing more ancient battle games, you know, because I like that stuff. You know, it's so those are the, the topics. Like, and I'm also quite um, deeply read and studied in those areas. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've read, you know, I've read pretty much every ancient book in its original, you know, that ever was published. Because that's not that hard. It's only like 300 of them, so it's not like you know that's a great thing to do. But I've read all, you know, Livy and Arian and all those guys. And, cur- and courteous um and i've read you know i've easily read 300 books on the american civil war and american revolution and world war ii and pacific I, I i don't know a lot about europe but there's so many european war games i've always been more interested in the pacific so i've you know i've done i did you know and by the way pacific war which was a game i did in 1985 which is a very uh, detailed operational game in the war pacific is going to be i'm right in the middle of republishing that one so and I, and I said to myself, I said to my publisher and to my wife, I said, I would never design this game now. I, I don't even know why I designed it back. In, you know, I was 34 years old, but 
it's the kind of game that really puts you deeply into the topic, but it's, oh my God, I mean, <laughs> just do it. it's not a game I would design at this point in my career, but republishing it is sort of remind, reminding me of my old sins, but anyway. It's another game that Tom Bass, I'm sure, hates also. By the way. <laughs> and so, you know, when you when you see a, a Hollywood movie and it's set in a particular part of history, it's telling a particular story, you'll read the articles afterwards that say, you know, this didn't happen, this character didn't exist, this person is an amalgam of these three people. Can you take, or do you take, those kind of liberties with a war game design? No, never. Uh, no, I, although, a fam- funny story, so... Richard Berg, when he did Terrible Swift Sword, um, had had the you know Union and Confederate generals and colonels and all that stuff, and he put I don't remember which one it was, but one of the Union colonels has the name of his therapist. You know, it's not a real person, <laughs> and I never forgot that people who copied his order of battle years later that 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 therapist showed up in a number of war games afterward because they were using his game as the basis for their order of battle without doing their own research. And so Colonel, you know, Jones or whatever his name was, and we used to laugh about it because it would show up in the game. Oh, look, he, he copied my stuff because this guy's not real. But other than that, no, I everybody, everything I do in a game has to be connected very tightly to the history. Now, I might, you know, for like a good example, uh, when I did Pericles, which is over there on the table, uh, there, you know, when you're covering a war that covers, you know, you know, well, the first and second Peloponnesian War. So you're going basically 40 years of history, right? And these are ancient times, and and Greek generals never died of old age, right? They mm. they, they usually died on the end of a spear somewhere uh, in battle. So I didn't want the players. To, I'm, I'm going back now to the design thing. I didn't want the players to say, okay, on turn one, you know, here are the set of 10 generals you have, but in turn two half of those guys are dead now. And now there's another five guys showed up and, you know, I didn't, and I hate when you have to sort of do this, you know, shuffling in and out thing. So I came up with a whole concept about Stratagos, you know, that there's that the assembly is going to vote some guy to run the war and the amount of Stratagos, you know, these pieces hmm. is, rep- is, is how good a general is. And if you're not going to put a lot of juice behind him, he's probably not that good a general. He doesn't have a lot of resources. He's not going to do that. Well, if he's a great general, you're going to punch, so by putting, so by you, you in essence get to assign the rating of the general, even though he doesn't have a name. But it is capturing that idea that you know it's the assembly giving support to somebody so that he could be successful, or they picking a better guy. But I use this sort of abstraction, but the abstraction is tied directly to the fact that I know the name of every one of these guys, and they just didn't last that long. You know, right. they came and went for a lot of reasons, and and that wasn't what the game was about. So I kept that, you know, I I, I captured it, but I didn't have to do it literally. So I think that's where game design comes in versus just rotely, you know, putting an order battle down, pushing counter around saying that's history, which it's not, you know, it it may be history, but it's not good game design. So can you give us an overview of your game design? How do you get from, I I don't know, you're in the shower and you think, oh, the Battle of Guadalcanal would be fantastic. How do you get from that idea to, you know, something that's in my hands that I'm going to get destroyed at by every other player around the table? Well, um, okay, so so often I just read a lot, and um, and sometimes I'll see a phrase in a book that interests. Like I see the big picture of it, and I want to bring that into a game. Um, a game that I'm slowly working on. You were asking about topics, so I'm doing a game. It's not going to be a big game, but it'll be another game that Tom Bassel won't like. By the way, be, that'll be <laughs> a continuing theme throughout this podcast. But uh, but it's going to be called the Peace of Nicias. And it'll be kind of a small game. And the piece of Nicias for all those who, you know, of course, that wasn't on the front page of the New York Times. There were uh, in uh, the Peloponnesian War, there was an armistice for a period of time. It was called the Peace of Nicias, and for about fourteen years or so, you know, they weren't killing each other directly. You know, they were killing each other all the time. But they, Athens and Sparta weren't hammering directly at each other. They did it through surrogates or just the general noise of Greece. And the game is about. Nicias represents the peace, the peace function of trying to maintain the peace. And there's a group of people in Sparta and also in Athens who don't want a peace. And so the game is about, can I either maintain the peace while not losing, you know, like losing strategically, or is it about getting the war going again? And I win by that. 
And so there's an area I really want to capture that 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 political dynamic in a simple kind of way. So you can learn like, you know, there were people who didn't want this to happen and they were fighting against it. And there were people who did want it to happen. And now if you look at anything throughout history, even in today's world, that goes on all the time. You know, that there's always a group, you know, that's the Hawks and the Doves thing, right? You know, hmm. and this was the Hawks and the, but what was interesting in Greece is the Hawks lived in both camps and the Doves lived in both camps. And so which side gained ascendancy sometimes was a matter of a vote or whatever. Hmm. And, you know, you got three E4s are for war, they're going to push for a war. If there's three E4s out of the five for peace, they're looking for peace. And so that dynamic can be captured in a game in a very simple way, but it teaches you something about what's going on in this period of time. And that comes, by the way, directly out of Thucydides. You know, if you read the original text, um, that that story is in there. And so, I mean, I'm far from being an expert on war games, but mm -hmm. when, when people talk about you, they say, you know, one of the great contributions you gave to war gaming was inventing the card-driven system, card-driven war games. How did you come up with that idea? Oh, that, that's... Uh... Okay, and, and by the way, the card driven thing has now become part of Euro games. Is that you know, it, it, people use it everywhere now? Uh, so I'm kind of glad about that. But most people don't realize. You know, they say, "Well, that's not, I'm, I'm not into war games." Well, you're playing one effectively. You know, it's conflict. Anyway, how did I come up with that? So, um, American Revolution, American War of Independence, and um, I get a call from Avalon Hill, a guy named Eric Dot, who's the president. Nice guy. Uh, uh, may he also rest in peace taught me a lot about the business. Uh, he um, said he wanted an, a simple level game, you know, introductory level game on the American Revolution. I said, fine. It became We the People, by the way. Mm. And so, and Avalon Hill had a very uh, well, I mean, very well known and successful game called 1776, which is about the American Revolution. It's very much a, imagine a game where, you know, forgetting, it's like all, a lot of war games, you know, you got, I, got a, I got forces, you got forces, if I take your cities, I win the game. I mean, let's make it simple, right? And that's what 1776 is about. And it's a really, it's a, I played it a, a lot of times. It's a great game. So I said, okay, let me do a, I'm going to do a simple version of 1776. So I, I actually, did, and by the way, this has happened to me many times. I designed a full game, had rules, pieces, the whole thing. And then I go to the, uh, there's a very famous uh, library here in New York called the 42nd Street Library. It's right next, it's right off of Bryant Park. And I, I, I managed to get, I, I found a reference to a um, Lieutenant Colonel John Simcoe who was a British officer who fought in the American Revolution, and he was the head of the Queen's Rangers, which was like sort of a counterinsurgency unit. I didn't know that at the time. And they had an original copy of his memoir that was published, personally published in like London right after the war. You know, so there's like not a lot of these around. So I got permission. I go in there and, and, I, and the whole thing, like you have to wear white gloves. You can, you know, they, they have these. The, the book is like put on this special stand so it never opens up more than this. I can only have a piece of paper and a pencil. You know, they, they, you know, guys watch you like with a camera. If you move like to the left, they shoot you. You know, it's like it was very. I had this book and I read this book uh, in its entirety and I realized that the American Revolution that I learned about um, isn't the one that's in this book. Hmm. You know, that was George Washington and Yorktown and big battles. And this is about you know Westchester County and. You know, they're they're riding in at night and they catch like, you know, 12 colonials and they 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 shoot eight of them. And they hang four of them and, you know, back and forth raiding and really vicious stuff. You know, when you really read into it, hmm. uh, this unit. And I realized it was really like Vietnam. I mean, it's just a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insurgency war. And so so when people say so when I was doing the car driven game and I, by the way, that is a marketing term that came out of GMT. I had nothing. to do, I was not inventing a car driven game. Hmm. I actually designed an area control game that use cards, right? So it's an area control game, you know, which you know, how many, how much political control do you have in Virginia or New York or Pennsylvania or whatever? And that was what the game is. And that's how you win the game, by the way. And then I had event cards. And then one day I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know, I've got guys moving around and I got these event cards. I said, why can't I put them? What can I do this? Hmm. And, and so that's really what happened. And because, what happens in a lot of war games is that, you know, we love, like, you know, when I design a game, I'm trying to tell a story, a historical story, but I'm and not always, you know, but I'm trying to tell a story of some kind. And when you're telling an historical story, you want to have these cool, you know, the king is trying to give an amnesty or they, you know, 
Benjamin Franklin's off in you know, Versailles trying to get aid from the French, or all these things are important parts of the story. And we usually use like a table, you roll dice, and it's a random events table. And I finally realized that why can't I put the random events and the moving of the pieces and everything into just one mechanic? And that's really what I was doing. I was I was hmm. mushing together all of these different mechanics into a card. And I and everybody loves holding I happen to like holding it. I used to let my my father was a big gin rummy player. I loved holding a hand of cards. So I got a hand of cards and I can make choices. You know, I'm gonna play the the six of clubs now or the four of spades, you know, and you know, those kind of choices are um there. And it just kind of worked. And I was like, wow. And so I read so I threw away the first design and came up with this other design, which is we the people. And hmm. just to be clear, and I think it's true. I think Tom hated We the People back in the day, by the way. I think he didn't like it. I think very cool. I, I, I'm just picking Tom. I haven't liked Tom. I'm just giving him <laughs> but, um, but We the People won no award. All the war gamers like, went apoplectic. The war gamers went, what the hell? Is, this is a piece of garbage. And this, is, this isn't history. This is, this is just random nonsense and on and on and on. Now it's like mainstream. Hmm. So... So again, what if I had to say that if I have a failing as a game designer is I, I sometimes I'm like not where the audience is, you know, forget about whether it's better or worse. I just not where the audience is. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what it is. And, and actually I don't care if I'm going to do what I'm going to do, but, but that's how the card driven game got invented. And then it wasn't called a card driven game. It was like I said, it was an area control game with cards. And then uh, Gene Billingsley of uh, GMT games, he decided to call it a card driven game. Everyone, oh, and so now that people either liked it or they knew what they were going to call it when they hated it. And then there's right. been debates on Board Game Geek and other places like, what is a card driven game? And that goes on forever and ever. You know, it's a war game. It's not, a, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't waste any time on that stuff. But that's how the card driven game got invented. So I found myself in the last couple of years dipping my toes into the war game arena, especially yeah. I found coin games. Yeah, especially intriguing. I, I like the idea that they're they're not just the battles. They're also the politics. They're also the economy. They're also the way these things affect a group of people. How have you have you noticed a shift in the people playing your games and war games in general over the time that you've been designing them? Um, well, first off, uh, I have always been a major fan of political military games. And, you know, I did, I did do fire in the lake with Volko. Yeah. yeah so, I, I mean, uh, and, and fire in the lake was designed in its broad terms prior to Andy and Abyss coming out. Cause Volko and I started working on that, that before Andy and Abyss and then he came up with Andy and Abyss. And then I realized that a lot of what we had talked about for this Vietnam game could be made to work within the coin system. And so that's mm -hmm. what we did. But the reason it worked in the coin system was I saw it's usually the case that people see the U.S. obviously is separate from the South Vietnamese government. You know, that's not hard to believe. But they always saw the communists, uh, the, the, North, the North Vietnamese, as like them and the, and the Viet Cong were like one group. Even the U.S. military mm -hmm. often thinks it that way. And I never – and after reading the book by Francis Fitzgerald, The Fire in the Lake, I said, that's not the case. At least I don't see it that way anymore. And so, uh, so I always believe in political marriage games political military games and Pericles and Churchill and Versailles. Well, Versailles is really a, a political game about ending a war, but Churchill and Versailles and Pericles are political military games, just like not like coin because they're about different, but it is the political element driving the strategy, not the strategy being the point of the game. And so moving on then, you have been a very prolific designer over the years. What is the, what is the key to good game design? When, what, at what point do you think, ah, I've got it? I have, I, well, you know, again, this is good game design as I see it, right? Again, go on BGG and you can find a uh, hundred people think I, I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And to include Tom Vassell, I believe. Um, <laughs> I see a theme developing here. Well, I, think, I, I just like to poke Tom's a good guy. And I like to poke him every so often because every time I do a game, he just tells me why he thinks it stinks. And so I, you know, so there's a good example. Ask Tom why I'm not a good game designer. He'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I would say is when I, 
my my standard is when I am addicted to the design to play it, like I want to play it over and over again, then I'm there. Now, does that mean that other people will think that way? Can't tell. Don't worry about it. But until I feel like I want to play this game anytime, if you said to me, I want to play this game you did, I'll play it because I want to play it. Uh, so that's really my standard of when a game is ready and when it's good. Uh, but uh, it's nothing to do with, it's a very subjective standard, obviously. So what can we expect from you in the sort of near to medium future then? Well, okay, so did you see this game I did on, the, I did a very, I have a good friend, Roger McGowan, and I've been doing, um, and I, and it's actually an old SPI marketing scheme. Uh, I produced one game on a topic in C3I magazine. So I did Gettysburg and I did Waterloo. And they were very, very, you know, they both got nominated, you know, and these are like little games. I mean, Gettysburg has 19 pieces in it, right? So people go, your games are, you know, war games are complicated. It has 19 pieces, okay? How complicated is a game that has a piece of paper size map and 19 pieces big, right? And it's not. Uh, it's got four pages of rules. So, again, you know, people have their stereotypes. But Gettysburg is going to spawn, it's already, I'm almost done with it. It's called Rebel Fury, which is a whole, I'm going to do a whole series of American Civil War grand tactical battles, you know, all the famous ones, right? So, I, you know, uh, Ch uh, Chickamauga, which was a battle that was fought in, 18, uh, in 1863, and, uh, you know, Chancellorsville, and that kind of thing. And, it'll, and each game will come with like four or five battles, and I'll do multiple volumes, and, you know, so that's something that's coming, at, coming along. Pacific War is starting to roll into the water, hopefully not sinking. No, it, it's just... It's an old reprint from 1985. <laughs> I've been working very hard on it. And we're kind of, you know, the rules have been rewritten by, uh, you know, Kai Jensen. And, you know, the art has been done by Mark Simonich. And, you know, so we're, you know, we're, 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 we're starting to get there. So that one's coming down. And then um, I, I'm working on this piece of Nikias game. I'm working on the, uh, the assassination of Caesar game. Um, there's some ancient themes. Uh, I'm going to do a game. Uh, I think I'm going to do a game using the Empire of the Sun system on the Mediterranean, you know, the whole war, World War II in the Mediterranean. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I might ultimately back into a European war game that way, but not sure yet. Um, and uh, what else is I'm working on? Oh, I have a game on uh, ancient Chinese, you know, the uh, Seven Kingdoms phase of China uh, called Sun Tzu. What else would you call a game on a China war from that period? Um, uh, that, that's sort of like the top of mind. Stuff. Oh, and of course, right now, um, I'm very, we're, we're actually getting ready to go into playtesting. Uh, Jeff Engelstein and I did a follow on to Versailles 1919 called Triumvir, which is Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus in the end of the Roman Republic. You know, so it's a Versailles game in ancient Rome at the end of the Republic period. So those are the games that, oh, and I'm also doing a Roman Civil War game uh, using a system that I. <laughs> Very similar to Mark Simonich's uh, um, uh, Gallic Wars uh, game he came out re recently. I'm doing like sort of the sequel to it on the Roman Civil War. So those are the things I'm working on. So yeah, we're, imagine it's 2022. You're in Essen mm -hmm. and you go out for a, a beer to a, a German restaurant and you're, you're coming back from the loo and you hear a table of gamers and they're, they're talking about you. You hear them mention your name. So you sidle into a corner to eavesdrop. What do you hope they're saying about you? I, I will tell you a, a true story of something similar to that. So let's just go with it. Would that be okay? <laughs> that would be perfect. So I'm at a game convention. I'm not working. I'm, I'm, I'm not a full-time game designer. I'm doing it part-time. So this would be somewhere in the 1990s. And um, my Peloponnesian War game that came out of uh, Avalon Hill under the Victory Games label was in production at the time. And I'm walking through the comp uh, late at night. We're coming, up from, coming back from a beer. It, and actually, we came from a, uh, a German restaurant in, um, uh, you know, uh, a convention that was, uh, I'll remember the city in a minute. But Richard Berg, myself, and Gene Billings, we were walking through the hall. And I look off, and there's this guy who's got a game, which is clearly a Peloponnesian war game. So I walk up to the guy. I said, hey, is this a Peloponnesian war game? He goes, yeah, and Avalon Hill was going to produce it until that <laughs> Mark Herman sent his game in and they, they, they rejected mine. So I go, Mark Herman, 
I hate Mark Herman. He goes, I hate him too. So we 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 bashed on me for about and Richard Berg and Gene Billings they had fallen down on the floor somewhere in the corner. And so I I bashed I, I, so he and I spoke about all my ills together. It was like almost like a therapy session for me. <laughs> and and when we were done, I said, Hey, good luck with the game. I shook his hand and he never I and I walked away. And you know, and I just felt like I made him feel better. <laughs> so if I was walking mm-hmm. back from your German Lou and they I, I don't know, you know, if Tom Bassel were there, he'd tell you what a bad game designer I was. So it just, that's what I'd probably end up hearing. But what I would want to hear, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I'm from New York City. I was born in Brooklyn. And I have, a, I have a, a hide like a rhino. And the only time I respond to things online when people, like I'll say, Mark Herman is this, that, or the other thing, the things I will respond to is not the personal nonsense. I don't care. Uh, they mean nothing to me. But mm-hmm. when they say something about one of my games, which is like, like this game does this. And I go, that's not even true. I will fi- I will write reply to the inaccuracy and no more. Because, you know, somebody's mm-hmm. going to say, you know, this game has 400 pieces and it goes, it's got 19. You don't want to say, well, it really only has 19, not 400. Okay. Just to be clear. That's the kind of thing I would respond to. And then some people will say, well, you're really thin skinned. I go, no, I don't think so. I just don't like, I don't like false statements excellent so one last question then sure. why is gaming good so gaming so I, the olympic you know so for many many years uh chess tried to become an olympic sport you know they they, they tried to get chess in there you know they said this is like serious stuff and all that and it went on for, I don't know, quite a while. And finally, and the Olympic Committee came back and said something that I think is going to be my answer. They said, the Olympics, you know, as we know them, are physical sports. Chess is a mind sport. Hmm. And I believe that the health of a person is based on the balance of their mind and their body. So if you just work that all the time and then just, you know, watch reality TV, you, you'd probably lose, your IQ would drop by half over a year. I mean, I think that's what it's just like eating. Or if you just did something very cerebral, but you sat on the couch and you ate bonbons and became really fat, that would be bad. So either, either having your brain go, you know, flat or your stomach go big, either way, you're not going to be a healthy human through your lifetime. So I've always believed that I, I exercise vigorously. Even I'm 66 years old and I still, I'm, I'm within eight pounds of when I graduated college, which was a long, long time ago. And I'm pretty strong, you know, and that's kept me healthy, you know, so I, my mind and then I, I engage my mind and I don't watch reality TV because I do find my IQ dropping. But on the other hand, I do um, read a great deal. I play games. I interact with people. So there's a social dimension of it. So games really are the mind sport that my, my physical sports need to balance my body. So that's why games are good in my mind. Brilliant. Well, Mark, thank you so much for giving over your time and coming on the show. And, and, and give, my, give my regards to my good friend, uh, Tom Bassett. <laughs>